Dr. Foster, are you there? Yes. Okay, great. Welcome to June's APTA podcast for the Neurosections Vestibular SIG. Our topic this month in June is vestibular migraine. My name is Ethan Hood. I'm the Assistant Director of the St. Luke's Warren Balance Center and St. Luke's Warren Concussion Center in Phyllisville, New Jersey. We have a wonderful guest for us today. We have Dr. Carol Foster, who is an otolaryngologist. She's the Director of the Balance Laboratory at the University of Colorado Hospital. She's also an Associate Professor of Audiology, Otolaryngology, and of the Rehab Medicine Department at the University of Colorado as well. Thank you very much for coming today, Dr. Foster. Thank you for inviting me. Okay. Now, as far as vestibular migraine, how prevalent is vestibular migraine in the population? Well, I can say that it's very common in a dizziness population. Okay. It accounts for at least a fourth of the dizziness patients that I see. Okay. And migraine itself is, oh, perhaps 10% on average of the general population with maybe a third of those suffering from dizziness. So you can see it's a very large number of people, many millions in this country. Okay. Is there a certain demographic that they generally affect? Migraine can begin in young children, but we see it tending to show uh, an increase around the time of puberty and then uh, another increase in frequency around the time of menopause in women with not as many cases in uh, the older age groups. So it tends to peak between puberty and menopause more in women than in men. But men are also affected. Is it generally linked to hormonal imbalance then or hormonal changes that bring on the migraine symptoms then? Uh, I would say that hormones in women seem to be a major factor. There is some increase in puberty in men, but it isn't as dramatic and the migraines tend not to be as severe. Okay, okay. Now, now when we see someone clinically, what are the, the symptoms of, of, of that vestibular migraine that we'll possibly see? Well, typically there's a broad range of symptoms in the same person. Mm -hmm. So instead of having very stereotyped attacks, they tend to have a variety of different descriptions. Sometimes they'll have momentary dizziness. Sometimes they'll have it go on for days, mm -hmm. and the spells tend to vary in duration in the same person. So they're not exactly the same repeated spells. And the quality of the dizziness can range from just momentary not right feeling to mm -hmm. A rocking sensation to violent spinning. Okay. Are, are, is, are there any type of, of specific diagnostic criteria to classify something as a vestibular migraine versus a, a, a typical migraine or a migraine with aura or a migraine without aura? Well, of course you're going to want to have a history of migraine mm -hmm. in the patient. Now, you don't always get a good history of migraine. Occasionally someone comes in who hasn't yet developed classic headaches. Mm -hmm. However, um, if you have a history of migraine, particularly a family history of migraine, that's a strong indicator that they are at risk. So some of them will have um, ordinary migraine. Mm -hmm. Others will have migraine with aura, and it will typically be a visual aura, although mm -hmm. I've occasionally seen people with more complex auras who also have the dizziness. But the dizziness can be an aura, so it makes Make it, it can become circular and that the dizziness may be an indicator that they have migraine with aura on its own. Mm -hmm. You have to look at the relationship between the times of onset of the dizziness and the headache it, itself. Do you possibly see other, other symptoms like nausea, imbalance, um, possibly vomiting with, with the, the migraine as well? Yes. People <clears throat> with migraine in general are more sensitive to vestibular stimuli. They're more likely to develop motion sickness when they have any kind of vestibular problem. So they'll often say, I feel motion sick when I have it. They'll have more difficulty riding in a car, especially if they're also having the dizziness. Mm -hmm. And they're more likely to have nausea or vomiting even during, say, testing of the balance system than other patients. So, so are there any diagnostic tests that you can possibly do for migraine or vestibular migraine, or is it more of a diagnosis based upon a symptom cluster? Well, there is the, the symptom cluster is important because basically uh, the testing in uncomplicated migraine should be normal. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, having normal testing in the face of uh, profound symptoms 
is, in fact, a strong indicator that it's migraine. Mm-hmm. Um, so typically the hearing and the balance testing will all be normal, or if anything, there will only be slight positional nystagmus. Okay. Um, so, so as far as vestibular migraine, are, are there very specific diagnostic criteria that someone has to meet in order to be diagnosed as having vestibular migraine? Or is it more just having a symptom of, of dizziness or vertigo accompanied with a possible uh, migraine headache um, and other migraine, migraine type of symptoms? Well, I am very open-minded in my diagnosis. There are uh, people who have attempted to make a criteria mm-hmm. for it. You know, the Chinese restaurant thing, you know, one from column A, one from column B, and mm-hmm. it adds up. I think you'll miss too many doing that mm-hmm. because at present we don't have an objective test for migraine. There is nothing that you can do to prove someone has it or does not. Mm-hmm. It's all clinically based. And so then to go on and use a migraine with dizziness as a different disorder just magnifies the uh the lack of information that we have. So Mm -hmm. I think it's better to maintain a strong level of suspicion. I would hate for people to not be treated Mm -hmm. because someone thinks they don't quite meet a criteria when, in fact, treating them would make the symptom go away. Okay. So how do you treat the vestibular migraine then? It's multi-pronged. First of all, I look at what their triggers are. Most migraine has environmental Mm -hmm. or hormonal triggers. And so I try to determine what the major triggers are for the patient. So say someone has a very strong hormonal association. Mm-hmm. I want to look at that, especially in women. I want to look at whether they are taking birth control pills or using uh, hormones after menopause because we might be able to eliminate the hormones mm-hmm. and cause improvement. Uh, and next, I want to see if they have any consistent food triggers. Mm-hmm or whether their triggers are primarily related to the weather or to sensory stimuli. Okay. Having intense sensory experiences like flashing lights, loud noises, um, irritating noises or smells, all of these can set off attacks, and sometimes by modifying those and having them avoid things that set it off, they can actually reduce the number of spells that they have. Okay. So besides uh, taking care of the external stimuli, such as foods and and allergies and everything like that, um, how else would you treat them in terms of of medication-wise? I know it's very individualized, but but in general, in terms of how you treat uh, migraine and vestibular migraine, what are the typical medication classes that you use? I try to listen to the patient's symptoms before picking the medications, Mm -hmm. but I do have a stable of medications that I will reliably use. So if the patient suffers from uh, classic ordinary migraine, mm-hmm. garden variety migraine, and typically those patients have difficulty sleeping, I like to start with amitriptyline or nortriptyline, mm-hmm. which tend to help that sleep disorder, and I think that may be one of the big factors in improvement in that group. Okay. If they have a lot of anxiety and palpitations, then I might go for something like verapamil Mm -hmm. as the first line. Uh, Typically, if they fail amitriptyline, I also move to verapamil. Okay. And then people with more resistant uh, migraines or who have uh, auras, I might go to uh, topiramate or acetazolamide. Mm -hmm. So as, as far as the vestibular migraine goes, how often do you refer to vestibular therapy? Again, it depends upon the patient's symptoms. Mm-hmm. If a person is getting motion sick just by walking around, mm-hmm. this is a good candidate for physical therapy. Okay. So some of these people will report that they can't go to the mall, they can't go to the grocery store, they can't stand to be in a movie with action scenes and a lot of panning of the camera because they start getting sick to their stomach. Mm-hmm. And this responds very well to confrontation with repeated uh, exposure to the same stimulus. Okay. Now, when, when you're uh, working in, in your balance lab and you push people or pa- vestibular patients and, and migraine patients through the battery of tests, do you see any changes uh, within the vestibular therapy um, or, with, or within the vestibular system, excuse me, um, with someone with a vestibular migraine if you're putting them through a VNG or posturography or possibly a rotary chair test? Well, 
you can use posturography before and after to monitor people. And actually, mm-hmm. I think if uh, if you're going to have people in physical therapy and you have access to posturography, especially a system where you can do therapy on the machine, you can actually show that, uh, an improvement over time. The the remainder of the tests. Mm-hmm doing a VNG, doing a hearing test, they're not likely to show any changes because they're normal to begin with. Okay. But on posturography, some patients show a pattern of imbalance that indicates that they have a nonspecific vestibular dysfunction, and that can be shown to improve over time. Okay. So essentially the, the vestibular migraine can possibly cause some central changes that we're not necessarily going to pick up on any type of, of testing, especially testing the peripheral vestibular system. But just knowing that and knowing what the symptoms are, we can treat it with vestibular therapy to alleviate a lot of the positional dizziness and a lot of the problems with their their function, essentially. Uh, Yes, I think you can. It's not as responsive as, say, benign positional vertigo, Mm -hmm. which is exquisitely sensitive to therapy. Mm -hmm. So you can have a near 100% improvement rate with that disorder. This one, you have to do a a longer course of treatment, and repeated exposure to the same stimulus. Is is there somewhat of a a lack of of research on vestibular migraine and and treatment for vestibular migraine, or is there a wealth of information out there? Well, I think the real weakness that we have, there's a lot of information out there, but the weakness Mm -hmm. that we have is that we do not have an objective test. It is all subjective. And so there are people who are called vestibular migraine who probably have other disorders. So until you come up with a a very clear-cut means of identifying these people so that there is consistency across research studies, you will not have that crispness of outcome that you hope to have with most research. Okay. Are, are, are there any specific types of, of vestibular therapy that you see generally works better with vestibular migraine, or is it just general vestibular therapy working on improving their uh, their tolerance to positioning uh, via habituation exercises, possibly working on adaptation exercises, um, or is it more of doing challenging type of exercises, like you said, if the person gets symptoms in the mall and things like that, um, relying a little more on things like optic neck stimulation and, and repeating patterns within their visual system to try to um, increase their symptoms for a short period of time in order to essentially habituate their brain into their symptoms? Well, I think the latter is is very important. Okay. I have therapists, for example, who will put up striped curtains on the walls and have the patient ambulate back and forth in front of the curtain mm-hmm. so that their eyes are being stimulated. Mm-hmm. I think that kind of thing is very helpful. Mm-hmm. I find it less helpful to do uh, exercises for the vestibular ocular reflex, mm-hmm. which is usually perfect in these people, mm-hmm. and they tend to feel like you know they wave the card back and forth and nothing's happening and they lose confidence in the, the treatment. Mm-hmm. So I prefer to have them do balance exercises, standing and balancing wall uh, looking at things or moving their head rather than just doing simple eye movement exercises. Okay. I, I know in our clinic we use uh, optic tank stimulation. We use disco ball in, in a room. Yes. And actually, that it works wonderful. Um, to, yes, to, I think to that kind symptoms. of thing, uh, accompanying balance exercises, is very useful. Yeah, checkerboards, anything like that, anything to, to essentially cause that type of stimulation um, definitely works well. Exactly. Now, are, are, th- are there any... Uh, promising or new treatments on the horizon for, for vestibular migraine? Any new medications, any research out there showing that a specific um, type of treatment works better than others? Well, one of the newer things that we've been working on here is the interaction between migraine and sleep apnea. Mm-hmm. It turns out that uh, a lot of patients who have sleep apnea who also have migraine, and the two don't cause each other necessarily. I mean, you can have migraine genetically and then develop sleep apnea because you become overweight Mm -hmm. and your your airway is compromised. If you have migraine with sleep apnea, you tend to have very severe migraine that cannot be treated with medication. Mm -hmm. But it can be treated with CPAP. So getting oxygen at night can help you get rid of your migraines. Do you see that people are underdiagnosed with having sleep apnea when they when eventually they do reach your your office with migraine? Uh, yes, actually, the sleep apnea 
piece has become more and more important as the years have gone by in that um, probably it accounts for a large percentage of people with migraine that doesn't respond to medication. So basically now every time I see a migraine patient, regardless of their weight or appearance, Mm -hmm. I ask them if they snore. Mm -hmm. For example, I had a patient, a 110-pound woman, very thin, who is having severe migraine with aura and severe dizziness. We could not control it with medication, and it turned out she had severe sleep apnea, which was totally unexpected. Treatment of that prevented all of her auras, and in fact, she'd had several small strokes, which all stopped after the treatment. Hmm. So what what would be the pathophysiological reason why sleep apnea and migraine are, are correlated? What's happening with sleep apnea? Is, is it just the hypoxemia that's causing the migraine as, as a trigger, or what exactly is happening? Well, it appears, uh, and if you look at the literature over the last couple of years, sleep apnea is a major vascular risk factor. Mm-hmm. So the hypoxemia at night probably causes some vasoreactivity for the ensuing day. Mm-hmm. And so you're more likely to have vasospasm and uh, other problems, both in the heart and in the head. Mm-hmm. So uh, undoubtedly it is additive with other causes of vasospasm like migraine. Very interesting, very interesting. Well, Dr. Foster, on behalf of the vestibular SIG of the neuro section, the APTA, I really appreciate your time today and thank you very much.